fantastic day coming at you uh, on a beautiful glorious fantastic wednesday hope you all are having a fantastic day and i'm back i'm back very briefly because next week i'll be down in florida uh, on vacation i'll be doing stuff down near st augustine so if anybody's i'll actually be traveling near orlando the day as well so might be able to uh see some people so that could be fun but yes, I am back uh, making sure I get in another one of these videos uh, tomorrow. We'll be getting into a uh, a um, video in De Revelazione with Ethan. Uh, we're supposed to, Lord willing, have that tomorrow. And then also we'll be continuing the commentary series on the Ten Commandments, actually finishing that one up. So yes, I'm back and I've been doing things. So this should be fun. Now, you may be confused by the thumbnail because this thumbnail does not have uh, Dennis Patavius on there. This has somebody else, uh, Cardinal Frangelin. So I think I've mentioned Cardinal Frangelin to you guys before, but Cardinal Frangelin, he was a mid to late 19th century Jesuit thinker. He was part of the Collegio Romano uh, group. Uh, actually, <laughs> I, have, I have slides for this. Uh, you can look at a picture of them right there. But uh, with Cardinal Franzlin, born in 1816, entered the Jesuits at 18, uh, late 20s. He was already teaching Hebrew and Rome. Very brilliant guy. And what's super important for him and the reason why uh, I'm using some of his resources right now is that he was one of the Collegio Romano theologians. And they really... Uh, had expertise in synthesizing scholastic and positive methods of theology. What do I mean by scholastic and positive methods? So positive theology uh, is really concerned with the theological loci, so the sources of theology. So that would be like looking in scripture, tradition, uh, the teaching of the church, so on and so forth, and gathering out where uh, those sources teach um, the certain proposition of theology. So uh, what the Collegio Romano were good at is they were good at not only um, applying the methods of scholasticism in definition, division, and so on, but also in supporting these um, by an analysis of the church fathers of scripture and of the teaching of the church. So uh, it can provide a very uh, interesting synthesis to work off of, especially on an issue uh, like the filioque. But uh, Franzlin, he was huge in the First Vatican Council. He worked with several uh, Roman congregations, eventually became a cardinal, and then he uh, died in 1886 at the age of 70. Okay, so why Hassan in the chat? I'm not, not even going to, bro. So uh, Thesis 22 is what we'll be working off of uh, from his De Deo Trino. Uh, that is his tract on the Trinity. And in Thesis 22, he's going to be showing uh, the teaching of the Filioque uh, from sacred scripture, uh, specifically from John 16, 13 through 15. Although what's interesting about Franzlin, and I really appreciate this, is that actually uh, his interpretation of this text draws from uh, the larger context of the Gospel of John, especially looking back to John 15. And then also uh, parallel statements made throughout the Gospel of John. So what we're going to see is that uh, basically any sort of a contrary interpretation of this text by the Orthodox 
is going to be something that's completely ad hoc. It's not supported from the grammar of the text, the uh, the logic of the text, the parallel text in the Gospel of John, um, and in the larger uh, context of John 15 through 17, uh, really. So it's going to be something completely ad hoc. Uh, it's not going to be well well supported, uh, but rather uh, our reading of the text is what's well supported. And our reading of the text, we can also add that sort of cherry on top of divine simplicity, although uh, I kind of want to abstract uh, from that debate and more, uh, more so look into the text itself. So the, uh, the text of John 16, uh, thir 13 through 15, it reads, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he should take of mine, and shall show it unto you. So as generally looking at the sort of logic of the passage, what our Lord is trying to prove here is our Lord is trying to prove that the Holy Spirit's teaching, so when, uh, when Christ ascends into heaven, and he sends the spirit uh, and he sends it uh, at uh, he sends it at Pentecost, really, uh, most principally when the spirit uh, is leading his disciples into all truth, that truth that they lead them into, that is that that lead the apostles and uh, their successors into that will not be any different from the truth that he speaks to them in that discourse, uh, which is from John 15 to 17. That's that's the context of the quote and and the the ratio. So the the sort of we can look at uh, ratio is kind of like the fundamental reason or underlying explanation uh, for this, for the fact that their teaching will be unified has to do with, as he says, that he will receive of mine. So that he will receive from me. So there's something there's there's a communication that's occurring from the son to the spirit the general argument is going to go well what is this communication and we'll see throughout the the context of the passage looking all the way back to the end of john chapter 15 and then also looking at the parallel passages where our lord uh, uses similar language to speak of his own relationship with the father but this is really speaking about the procession of the uh the spirit from the son although we could also talk about divine simplicity blah blah, blah. but uh, that's not really going to be uh, helpful in, in your discussions with, with the Orthodox. So when Christ says that all things that the Father hath are mine, this is seen as kind of the, the foundation for this whole text making sense. There's a unity in teaching with the Father who sent the Son and the Son uh, and the Spirit who's sent by the Son. There's this unity of teaching. And why is there this unity? Because all things that the Father hath are mine, and that the Spirit receives from the Son. And as we saw at the end of uh, John 15, which we'll get into, is the Spirit proceeds from the Father. And all that the Son, uh, all that the Father hath are mine, therefore, we can, we can rightly conclude, and it makes sense from the passage, and we'll see this uh, as I explain it more, that the uh, Spirit also proceeds uh, from the Son which is already explicit when he talks about the reception, the reception of truth. So um, this is seen as the, as the grounds for the, for the filioque in the passage. So now let's look at, uh, look, look at this specific statement. He shall not speak of himself. So that is the spirit shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear that he shall speak. So here, Christ is explaining why the Spirit is truth or truthful or absolute truth. Why the Spirit's going to speak in line with the Son. And the ratio for this, so the foundation that he's going to bring forth for drawing this conclusion, is that he hears. He doesn't speak from himself. He hears. So this, uh, this truth, which is going to flow from the Spirit, is something that's not of himself. It's not from himself. It's not uh, he, he doesn't he doesn't bring out truth from himself like like the Father does, who's the eternal fount of truth. Rather, 
The Spirit is somebody who receives truth. And who does he receive truth from? He receives truth from the Son. Now, when it comes to a divine person, what else is reception going to be? Besides origination uh, from another rather than from himself. He says he's of the he's of the sun. He receives from the sun. He receives truth from the sun. And now we can uh, begin from here, uh, start talking about divine simplicity and say, well, truth is something which is going to be essential. And even, even if we just sat here and pretended, um, let's just pretend uh, for, a section, sec, uh, for a second that the essence energy's distinction is correct. What's going to ground that reception right there of truth from the sun? Is it going to be some sort of uh, extrinsic, secondary, accidental relation that's that's uh that's going to be uh, entered into after the processions no that's that's speaking about god in a very human way no of course not it's going to be something that's going to be grounded in the eternal and essential and hypostatic procession of the the spirit from the sun even if we were to grant that formally speaking this is speaking about an energetic procession we're going to ask what founds that what's the fundamentum for that what's the what's the foundation uh, that's going to ground that. And that's going to be a hypostatic procession. So no matter where you go, you're going to lead back uh, to this. So uh, what, what actually confirms this, confirms that this uh, receiving, this hearing, um, confirming that this hearing has to do with um, something related to a hypostatic procession, we can look at how the son himself speaks about his relationship with the father. So uh, will I keep this live stream up after? Yes. So we can look at John 8. So what's interesting is when you look at the other passages in the Gospel of John where the Son is speaking with his own relationship with the Father, the Son is going to um, provide as a grounds for his own unity with the Father, his own begetting from the Father, his true sonship, He's going to ground this with a very similar argument, actually with, with a completely parallel argument. So if the son is teaching his own uh, begottenness from the father, at least using that as a foundation for, for the true reception of, of, uh, of truth and the unity of their action and speaking, then how all of a sudden when it comes to the spirit, we're just going to ad hoc explain this away. Really, that's what it is. It's not explaining things in accordance with the clear meaning of the text. So John 8, quote, He that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Notice, son's hearing of the Father. Ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. In John chapter 5, then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doth, these also doeth the Son likewise. You see, the same sort of relationship is being, uh, is being explicated between the Son and the Father, and it's being grounded uh, that he is the Son, uh, and that the Father is the Father uh, from these things. So we can uh, continue thinking about uh, what here means. And again, as I said, uh, if you're going to take here as anything besides uh, procession, you're going to absolutely obliterate the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Because uh, wisdom then is going to be some, some something which is accidental to him, something which accrues by a different relationship uh, than his uh it's going to be really something which is extrinsic to his hypostasis. It's going to be just like the way in which we receive wisdom. Uh, that is something which is an accident to us. But if it's received uh, in his very uh, hypostatic uh, reception of, of the numerically singular uh, divinity, then uh, we've already proved our point and we retain it's teaching on the divinity of the Holy Spirit. So it's also clear from the context um, when we're looking at who, who is the who is the Spirit hearing from? Because some Orthodox, historically, Photius did this actually. In order to 
uh, in order to get past this very um, solid argument, what they did is they took uh, back here, he shall receive of mine. They, they, were, they interpreted mine as my father. He shall receive of my father which grammatically speaking is just ridiculous. And contextually speaking, this is ridiculous. Because again, the whole context of this discourse is looking at why does the spirit speak in line with the son? Why does the spirit speak in line with the son? And the son says, well, because he, his wisdom is from me. His knowledge is from me. His truth is from me. It's from me. He receives from me. He hears from me. That's why. And then, uh, and then, of course, there's the mention of the father there, which is really interesting. Because why, uh, uh, we'll get into this, but uh, really, uh, why does the son in this passage mention the father? Doesn't make any sense for the son to mention the father, unless he was saying, uh, he, he's pointing to this uh, sort of linear progression of the uh, the father to the Son, and the Son to the Spirit. The Spirit comes from the Son because the Son is received from the Father, and all that the, the, the Son hath is from the Father. It makes perfect sense. When, when you're reading things in context without a sort of pre-existing ideology, which you're trying to impose upon the text, things make sense. Things click into place. That's what we're seeing here. But um, in order to refute this, we, we can just look at, uh, I don't think there's really any modern Orthodox who are going to bring forth this argument just because of how ridiculous it is. But St. Cyril, uh, he teaches otherwise, lest anyone should suspect that the teaching of the Holy Spirit might at some time not be in accordance with his mind. He clearly shows that since the Spirit is his, he will also convey words from him. So he's clearly talking about um, the spirit as receiving from the sun and then um christ also expressly states that this procession uh when he says to take and points to himself as the source when he states of mine so it's, it's really it's really just explicit actually i don't uh i don't even really need to uh <laughs> keep going on this or to talk about the grammar at all so uh when we're looking at the term mine so what does mind uh, receive of mine mean so what is mine is obviously that which the son formerly possesses. So this isn't merely talking about uh, something uh, of the son being an instrument of the father's communication. So the son isn't merely an instrument of the procession of the spirit. No, the son is actually giving what is his, what is internal to him, what is formerly possessed by him. He's giving the divinity. Absolutely. We, we, we need to say that that's what mine means. What else would mine mean? And then uh, further, uh, we can look at the ratio, which is given for the glorification of the son's person by the spirit. So why, 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 would the, why would the son be glorified if this is merely talking about my father? He shall receive of mine. That, that's, what, that's what makes the son glorified uh, in this passage, is that he receives from mine. If he doesn't receive from his, if he receives from his father, not him, then why would it make sense to bring that forward as an argument for um, Christ's glorification? Okay, so uh, the, really the key to the interpretation of this entire text is looking back at John 15, 26. And I actually want to bring up uh, the text uh, so it's right in front of us. So... There's a, this is in the midst of a discourse by Christ. So look, John 15. So this is where, in the midst of a discourse by Christ, uh, which he's basically proving um, the sort of Trinitarian unity right here at the end, at the end of John chapter 15, it says, but this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled, what, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the father, even the spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the father, he shall test, testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness because ye have been with me from, from the beginning. So you get this uh, ending a, uh, a sort of discourse that he goes on about the uh, the vine and the branches up here. 
that Christ is the true vine. And then I want you to be, pay very close attention to this phrase right here, spirit of truth. And then in the next chapter, in chapter 16, um, these things I've spoken unto you that you should not be offended. Then he goes through another round of um, of speaking to them about these practical concerns, about the fact that they will be persecuted and, and so on and so forth. And then look at this. So from verse 1 to 12, there's kind of like this interlude uh, right here, talk, giving more instruction. And then he goes back to Trinitarian talk. So how be it when he, the spirit of truth, notice, so la when's the last time the spirit of truth was spoken? At the end of chapter 15. And remember, in the original version, there's no chapter markings, and this is one big, long discourse. So to get the interpretive key of this spirit of truth passage, where should we look? Where should we look? We should look at the, the previous spirit, spirit of truth passage. That would make sense because, you know, we're going to think back, oh, he, he said something about the spirit of truth earlier. And then what did he say about the spirit of truth? Let's go back. He said, when the Comforter has come, so that's when the Holy Spirit has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. So Christ is going to send the Spirit of truth from the Father. Even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. He shall testify of me. So um, there's a lot to speak about the Father uh, throughout this, especially at the end right here. And really what's what's um, being connected is there's kind of like this concatenation. I think that's the right word, concatenation, which is going on here. So Father sends the Son, Son does his work, and then Son leaves, Spirit is sent, and uh, the, uh, the Christ is sending the Spirit who proceeds from the Father, that Spirit of truth. And there's going to be a unity of their, of their teaching and witness right there. And, and the spirit of truth is going to be witnessing to the sun. And then after a brief interlude, when we get back here, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear that he shall speak and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So why why does why does Christ here in verse 15 why why in the world in verse 15 does Christ bring up all things that the father hath are mine therefore so why is this therefore what is the therefore 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 said i that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you so why does it make sense that all things that the father hath are mine is being connected to he shall he shall receive of me. He shall take of mine. Why are those two being connected? Well, if we go back to the original, so the first mention of the Spirit of Truth at the end of John chapter fifteen, we see exactly why, because the Spirit proceeds from the Father. So let, let's think of this logic right here. Okay, so the Spirit proceeds from the Father. All that the Spirit hath are mine. I mean, all that the Father hath has uh, I'll, I'll speak in normal language so the spirit proceeds from the father all that the father has is mine therefore ergo etc ergo etc well, what's what, what's the conclusion right there well the spirit proceeds from me or in this language or as as our lord says here he receives of mine formally speaking those two notions proceeding and receiving Proceeding is just talking about the action. Receiving is talking uh, on the more on the part of the um, of the subject who receives. They're formally speaking the same thing. So it makes sense as the interpretive key of the John sixteen passage that we look back to uh, what is originally being said. So uh, I, I will I will go back to. Uh, to my name is Hassan. Oh, so this is this is a different Hassan. Oh, I thought you were Hassan, original Hassan, uh, trolling me. Okay, well, let's continue with whatever uh, Franzlin says, because I've I've uh, strayed off off my uh, off my mark from what Franzlin says. So. Um, 
this really, uh, this really, the interpretive key works when we look at all that the Father has is mine. Because um, the power and act to proceed is included under all. And otherwise, how do we make sense of that being the reason for the reception of the Spirit from the Son? See? It doesn't make sense otherwise. And then obviously, uh, we're excluding the Father's fatherhood, which the Father's fatherhood is the beginning of the Son. Obviously, that would provide a contradiction. But the uh, instance with the Spirit proceeding from the Son doesn't provide a contradiction. So now... Uh, we can really reduce this in, uh, really the teaching uh, is what's called an enthymeme. What's an enthymeme? An enthymeme is an argument with an assumed premise. So um, we can we can think of this like John is Catholic, therefore he believes in the filioque. That's an enthymeme right there. What's the assumed premise? There's an assumed premise going on there. The premise is that Catholics believe in the filioque. So John is Catholic. Catholics believe in the filioque. Therefore, John believes in the filioque. So the enthymeme that's going on here is basically, uh, let's go back just to the text. I'll point out the enthymeme. The enthymeme goes on right here. All things that the Father hath are mine, Therefore, I said, he shall take of mine. So what's the assumed premise here? Because it's an nth meme, so there has to be an assumed premise. The taking of, what, what is it? The taking of is something that's of the Father. So the fact that the Spirit receives from the Father means the Spirit receives from the Son, because all that the Father hath is, is mine. Or uh, to, to more cleanly state it, like Franz Lynn does. He states it like this. Oh, wait, no. He states it like this. Whatever the Father has is mine, but the Father has the power of the principle, that is to be the principle of the Spirit, so that the Holy Spirit may receive from what is the Father's. Therefore, I also have the same power of principle, so that the Holy Spirit may receive from mine. So again, this, this text makes perfect sense. Uh, in the Catholic reading. Perfect, absolutely perfect sense. And then Fulgentius uh, has, has kind of something similar when he says, therefore he received from the Son and all things that the Father has are of the Son, which the Holy Spirit received, because it is not from the Father alone, nor from the Son alone, but together from both. So uh, we can ask ourselves now, well, could he be speaking about a different procession? Could he be speaking about a temporal procession, an energetic procession, something, a, a procession that's distinct from a hypostatic procession? Could he be speaking about it? And along with Franzlin, I say absolutely not. This absolutely destroys, I think I said here, throws acid on the mystery of the Trinity. Absolutely destroys it. Franzlin says this argument demonstrates that the very notion and entire mystery of the Holy Trinity are being distorted by the schismatics. That is talking about the Eastern Orthodox. It absolutely destroys the notion of the Trinity, the unity of the Godhead, the essential perfection of the persons. Because you have to have truth as something that is extrinsic, secondary, accidental, however you want to put it. But it's not going to be something which is essential. Rather, you're going to put a schism in the Godhead. You're going to put a schism in it. That's what's going to happen. And Franzlin, he has a fantastic uh, response right here. He says, we could therefore respond in one word. Whatever and however one divine person, of which there's only one nature, nature is said to receive or rather take from another divine person, this can neither be said nor conceived without distortion of the entire mystery unless an internal procession is presupposed. For God cannot receive anything from another except as one person is related by origin to another. This origin is through the communication of the very divine essence. 
But we can also demonstrate this actually from the text itself. So, um, because this is this is normally what's going to be argued by the Orthodox. Let's go back to, um, I think this is a third. Yeah, let's go back here. They're going to say, okay, they're going to read the text. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, he shall speak, uh, that he shall speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. And say, well, show it unto you. He will guide you into all truth. He will speak. He will show you things to come. Well, these are obviously talking about economic temporal effects. So how can you say that this is speaking about the eternal perception of the Spirit? How? How can you say that? Well, the reason is, is that we have to concede. Of course, we're conceding that what is being spoken of here are temporal effects. But the foundation or the grounding, or we could say the ratio of, uh, of this unity of speaking is found in something eternal. That is the eternal reception because the Son has all things from the Father, including the power of procession. And uh, what, what's really great or uh, what's really really. Uh, what, what's just blatantly inconsistent on the way in which the Orthodox are going to receive are, are going to uh, read these texts. What's blatantly obvious is that the other parts of John that they use to demonstrate um, uh, John, actually just John uh, 1526, which is used to demonstrate the uh, by them the procession of the spirit from the father as eternal is talking about temporal procession. And it's being used, uh, it's being used, the, uh, the argument is grounding an eternal procession. So it, it speaks about, he shall testify. He shall testify of me. So you have to distinguish between that which is formally being spoken of and that which is fundamentally being spoken of. So it's speaking formally of temporal effects the grounds for that is uh, is being founded in um, an eternal reality. So, uh, as we can say, the economy reveals the theology, if you, if you want to speak in those terms. And then uh, you'll get the response, uh, ek perumenon, ek perumenon, ek perumenon. But really, any smart orthodox that you're going to talk to is going to say, well, actually, there's nothing intrinsic during that era about the language of ek perumenon. That is going to uh, definitively and necessarily result in um, a conclusion about eternal uh, eternal procession. Because I mean, again, the book of the common response of the book of Revelations. Well, when you look at the book of Revelation, it talks about the the water proceeding um, from the throne of God and of the Lamb. That that's talking about a temporal procession. It's within the semantic range of the term to be speaking about a temporal procession. And really, it wasn't until later. Um, Byzantine theology that you do get this uh, distinction, uh, which is more hammered out um, between different terms. So that has absolutely nothing, uh, nothing to do with it. Really, um, all of these texts are principally, formally, primarily talking about temporal processions, every single one of them. And if the economy didn't reveal the theology, if the temporal procession didn't reveal the eternal procession, we're going to see we would know nothing about uh, about the eternal procession of the Spirit. We would know absolutely nothing because every single text that you can ever bring forth is talking about um, temporal effects and reasoning back to or being founded upon um, an eternal procession. The Spirit will, see, will speak unto you because he receives from me. You have the temporal effect, the eternal reality. And they're being uh, really the ones being grounded upon the other. But of course, um, really, really, what's what's uh, what's blasphemous about um, the orthodox mode of argumentation here is what you're going to get is you're going to get in other places where our Lord is basing the eternal procession of the Spirit upon temporal effects. 
you're going to say that the Lord is just making a bad argument. That's what you're going to have to conclude. You're going to conclude he's making an invalid argument, which he's obviously not. And we see um, also the fact that operation follows upon nature, which is just a fundamental principle of philosophy. And then also we see that the Lord demonstrates his divine sonship based on um, based on operation, um, which is going to result in unity of nature. Unity of operation uh, follows upon unity of nature. And then uh, I'm not going to bring forward all the patristic texts, but we'll get there when we get to Book 7, Chapter 6 of Patavius. So now uh, the second place we can look in is the mention of the spirit of the sun, which is uh, which is a very fun one. So when it comes to the spirit of the sun, we have the genitive. So if you don't know what the genitive is, in other languages, such as Greek and Latin, we have of. Of isn't really, um, or at least doesn't necessarily need to be there in the text. Rather, we can change the form of the word to demonstrate some sort of relationship uh, between these two words. And one of those is the genitive. So spirit of the sun, the of the isn't there. Uh, it's not written down explicitly. Rather, it's implicit uh, in the form of sun, quiu. So uh, when it comes to the spirit of the sun, we have the genitive, and it's related to a certain person when speaking about the spirit. It's clear that it's not something which is adjectival. What do I mean by this? A bunch of fancy grammar terms. So this would be like the difference um, between the son of wrath versus the son of Bob. Son of wrath versus son of Bob. Son of wrath. Wrath is an adjective. So when we talk about the son of wrath, we're clearly not talking about the fact that the, the child was born of wrath. The fact that the child's father was wrath, clearly not. Rather, when we talk about the son of wrath, we're clearly talking about a wrathful son. It's an adjective. It's adjectival. When we talk about the son of Bob, we're not, not talking about uh, Bob in an adjectival way. That'd be ridiculous. We're not saying it's like, talking about like a Bobby son or something like that. That, that would be a Bobful son. That, that'd be stupid. Rather, we're talking about some sort of relation of origin. When we have two people related by the genitive like this. So we have the spirit of the sun. It's not like when we talk about the spirit of wisdom, which means uh, we're talking about a wise spirit. Or the spirit of holiness, we're talking about a spirit uh, which is holy or holy spirit. But when we speak about the spirit of the son or the spirit of the father or the son of the father, we're clearly talking about uh, relations. They're relative terms. So uh, this is something which... Uh, St. Augustine is going to explain. Uh, he says, Our faith is to believe and confess Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one God. However, we do not call the Son the Father, nor the Father the Son, nor the Spirit, who is the Spirit of both the Father and the Son, either Father or Son. By these names, what they are to each other, so that is rel relation, relations, relatives, something relative, is signified not the substance by which they are one. So this isn't talking about consubstantiality when we talk about the spirit of the Son. It's rather talking about a relation of the spirit to the Son. For when the Father is named, he is named as the Father of a Son. And the Son is understood as the Son of a Father. In the spirit of a breathing one, and certainly the breathing one breathes the Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit is spoken of in a certain unique way in relation to the Father and the Son, as their Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, that's all I have for you from Franzlin. Sorry if I was, uh, if I was scatterbrained during that. I feel like I wasn't uh, as well organized as I wanted to. But uh, otherwise, uh, all you have a fantastic day. Remember, if you appreciate this, because I know a lot of you have been telling me that you really enjoy this, uh, definitely consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash militant Thomist. Because if you become a patron, um, I have a lot more time to do stuff like this. Therefore, I make more videos, therefore, etc. So thank you and God bless.